You might not be aware of the fact that our new king is exempt from a considerable number of laws that the rest of us commoners are bound by. For example, our new king won't be paying a single penny's worth of tax on the £650 million estate he just inherited from his mother. The rest of us have to pay 40% of any inheritance over £325,000 to the government, meaning that because of this immunity, Charles has avoided paying £260 million of inheritance tax. He also isn't liable to pay income tax or capital gains tax. Now, since the 90s, the monarch has paid income tax voluntarily, but why on earth is that choice up to them? Perhaps most controversially, the king is also exempt from racial, ethnic, and sexual equality laws, meaning that it is impossible for any of the king's employees to make a complaint to the courts if they experience sexist or racist discrimination. In fact, it's actually impossible to bring any civil or criminal proceedings against the king. Why is the monarch exempt from the law in this way? Now there's a good question. But fear not, because the royal family's official website has the following to say. Although civil and criminal proceedings cannot be taken against the sovereign as a person under UK law, the monarch is careful to ensure that all their activities in a personal capacity are carried out in strict accordance with the law. Well, that's good, as long as he tries his best, I suppose. Well, Chris Mandapra is a professor of history at Tufts University with expertise in the history of colonialism and empire. Well, he joins us from Truro, Massachusetts. Uh, welcome to the programme. What do you make of the pomp and ceremony that we've witnessed so far with the Queen's passing? Well, you know, thanks for having me, first of all. And I've been struck by the the mania in uh, the media over, you know, covering the death of the Queen in this way. Um, yes, you know, mourning is, is definitely appropriate when there is someone who passes in a family and someone who's very well known. But in discussing and talking about the, the glorification of the Queen, as we're seeing in her passing, what aren't we talking about? You know, that's kind of the question that I'm left with, specifically the violence that has been committed in the name of this Queen really over the course of her whole reign. That's what really worries me, that that story is not being told and it's not in the media. So why is the legacy of imperialism still so important today then, do you think? Well, um, you know, there are many people in our world, in fact, the majority of our world, um, who understand uh, at a family level um, and at national levels uh, why imperial violence matters. Um, when we look at how decolonization ended, yes, it ended in the time in which Queen Elizabeth came to the throne in the 19... It began in the 1950s when she came to the throne. We've been in a period of decolonization from the 1950s onwards, but during the same period, we've seen ongoing injustice. Uh, we've seen under the rule of Queen Elizabeth, we've seen the violence... Um, and the plunder uh, and the massacres that took place in Malaya, uh, in Yemen, in Aden, um, uh, in Kenya, the Mau Mau uh, uprising. We've seen underdevelopment that has been made systemic in places like the Caribbean and Africa um, and even South Asia. And, you know, in my own research, I just determined, I discovered that it took until 2015 for the British government to, in fact, stop paying its debt that it took out about 180 years ago for slave owner reparations. And this was being carried on again in the name of the Queen. So the, the past of colonialism continues to live on today. And partly it's because we continue to tell the story of the empire and not appreciate the pain and the suffering and the plunder of those who have been colonized by that empire. That, that, that's something that we need to make some space for, I think. Some people might say that all the atrocities of imperialism were in the past, and so it's time to move forward now, time to move on. How would you respond to that? Well, I think it's, you know, convenient to um, think of atrocities as uh, kind of linked to a particular date in the past, and we're able to do that if we don't recognise the way that, in fact, atrocities continue through time. It, it, when you look at colonialism, the story is really not about an end followed by a beginning of, uh, you know, a commonwealth or a beginning of uh, the post-colonial era. It really is about injustices that have been papered over 
um, have not been uh, recognized, amends has not been paid, reparation has not been made. And because of that, in fact, this violence has become structural. It determines the international relationship between Britain and its post colonies, and it determines the national experience of people in the post colonial world today. Um, the suffering in the post colonial world. And that has a lot to do with unsolved business. Uh, and that also unsolved business is, is very conveniently being swept under the rug in this kind of you know, overt display of, of sadness and mourning. You know, I think of it another way, which is to say, why is it so easy to feel sorrow uh, and to feel mourning for the death of Queen Elizabeth II, but it's so hard to feel remorse for the death and the suffering of millions of people who have suffered in the name of Queen Elizabeth II. I think that's actually a very important question to sit with. Given what you say then, where does all this leave the future of the Commonwealth? Well, um, you know, back in November 2021, I think we got a clue to that story when Barbados took the step to leave the Commonwealth and to de declare um, its status as a republic. There are eight remaining um, Commonwealth nations in the Caribbean. Uh, I would imagine that we could expect to see others leaving in the coming years, and I would certainly welcome that as a path towards truth um, and acknowledgement of, of the past. But, you know, as we're having this, this, this thraldom um, internationally, really, we're, we're experiencing it in Britain, but I'm here in the United States, we see it all over our media today, is a thraldom um, of concern and, and, and sorrow and, and um, sadness uh, around the death of Queen Elizabeth II. You know, I'm in many ways wondering, when do we get to talk about the death of the monarchy? Uh, and I think that, in fact, would be something to look forward to in this 21st century. Chris Manjapa, Professor of History at Tufts University. Thank you very much indeed for joining us here on Al Jazeera. Thank you very much.